Thank you, Brother Darrell, for that, or Calvin, for that prayer. Uh, I just really sense each of you's prayers, and I sense that the Lord is here. I'm, I'm always blessed by that passage that Calvin shared. The Father ran to meet him. He had been watching down that driveway day after day after day. He saw him come. And I don't know who the Father is watching tonight and saying, I'm going to draw you. I'm going to have you come tonight. God only knows. But I believe there's going to be somebody who's going to surrender tonight. Uh, it may, you may be a Christian, uh, but you just want to sense you need a closer walk. The power of God is here tonight. I'd like for us to take our songbooks, 311. Come, gracious spirit. Come, gracious spirit, heavenly dove. With light and comfort from above, be thou our guardian, thou our guide. O'er every thought and step preside, o'er every thought and step preside. The light of truth to us display. And make us know and choose thy way. Plant holy fear in every heart that we from God may ne'er depart. That we from God may ne'er depart. Lead us to holiness, the road which we must take to dwell with God. Lead us to Christ, the living way. Never let us from his pasture stray. Nor let us from his pasture stray. Lead us to God, our final rest, to be with him forever blessed. Lead us to him, with bliss to share, only the joy. Forever there, fullness of joy forever there. Thank you. Well, I thank Steve for taking me through World Press, World Missionary Press today. I am just absolutely impressed with the uh, printing of the Word of God and pamphlets that are going across our globe. 351 languages and another 10 on the horizon. I just don't know how you would ever get to that kind of an organization to print the Word of God to people around that can't come to meetings like this. They can get a Bible or they can't get whatever, but they can get a pamphlet or whatever. So God bless that work. Well, folks, tonight... I'd like just to remind you, are you still yoked up with Jesus? Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and learn of me. We have some more things to learn because it's a lifetime of learning. I haven't got started yet. Brother Cowan's way a lot further ahead than me, and some of others of you are so much deeper and, and more rich. They have so much to offer. Anyway, uh, what I say tonight is if, if you have a problem with being yoked up and you'd like to rear away, you probably, I don't know, cattle years ago could probably slip out of that and, and the one that's been trained in his Bearing the yoke by itself is probably going to continue on, and you could maybe pull your head out of there. I don't know. 
And I, I have bucked this yoke many times and still do, and <laughs> it doesn't feel very comfortable. Let's get out of here. Taking up our cross and bearing our cross just is not fun for the flesh. Galatians 5.16 clearly says that the flesh and the spirit, they're contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. And it's just a matter of humbling ourselves and staying with the master and keep learning and keep plugging away. So that's my encouragement tonight. Stay with them. Stay with it. It's just a lifetime of, of giving ourselves, bearing up our cross, and so on. Uh, I want to ask you, what is that? What for sign is that? What are you supposed to do when you see a sign like that on the highway? Stop. You're supposed to stop? Yeah, if, if, you, if, if there's traffic coming, you're exactly right. You better would. Doesn't mean you can keep going, but what, what, how would you... Slow down, watch for a vehicle, and slowly, you can slowly proceed. You don't have to completely stop. But if there's traffic coming, you better would stop. But you means you can, com, you can proceed. But what are you doing? You're, you're, when, you, when you have a yield sign, what is actually happening in, on the highway and, and uh, so on? You're leaving a certain path and moving over to another, right? Leaving a highway and moving to another highway. Okay? Uh, It looks something like this. Here's a homemade one. You're rearing off the highway of, of the flesh life, the sin life, and you're yielding to a highway of holiness, a highway of righteousness. You, you follow what it's saying? You get it? You're leaving a lane and moving on to another lane. Okay. I want you to turn to the book of Romans, and we're going to walk through chapter 6. Before I do that, uh, back to what I said last night. In a weak conscience, there may be somebody here who has a weak conscience, and we've been bombarded with the outward If we're weak, we're bombarded with the outward. The Pharisees were bombarded with outward things. They were concerned about, Jesus said in Matthew 23, you're, you're keeping the outer, you're cleaning up the outer outside of the plat, cup and the platter. And he said, you're trying to do it backwards from the outside in. Or you didn't really care. He said, the inside's full of extortion. It's full of sin. It's full of wickedness inside, and you don't really care. You're, you're concerning, concerned about the outward. You're looking right. You're appearing right. That's weak. It's perhaps defiled. And Jesus said, makes a statement. He says, clean up the inside of the cup and the platter and also clean up the outside. So if you take all care of what's in your spirit, What's in your soul is going to manifest itself in the body. Jesus taught spirit, soul, and body for salvation. But we get it backwards. We want to look right on the outside. And, and Luke four, or Romans 14, a uh, few chapters after this, says that they were concerned about not eating meat offered to idols, which I covered in 1 Corinthians 8 last night. And what he also said was that this man said, yeah, he's going to be, eat vegetables. He's going to become a vegetarian. So he'll never be tempted to eat meat off her idols. Anybody here a vegetarian? You better get some meat in there sometime. You're going to 
Become a wimp. You need some protein. Get some strength. God gave us meat to be used. It's there for our good. And the other thing is it says that it doesn't have in 1 Corinthians 8 is, is it says about there was, they were concerned about certain days. And they were concerned about certain things they ate or drank. While I grew up as a boy, we observed Ascension Day. Anybody know what Ascension Day is? And I tell you what, that was a pretty strict day. If you, if you didn't observe Ascension Day, you were falling away from the faith. Why well, left the, didn't become a part of the old order? And I, I don't observe the Ascension Day today. There, so for a while, it bothered me. We should be observing Ascension Day. But you, I don't know, some word fell by the way, and I never read in scriptures that we have to observe Ascension Day, so I never developed any conviction for it. But I did, did, did read about observing the, the, the Lord's Day, one in seven. So I have conviction that I ought to observe the Lord's Day. I'm not going to go do my job. I'm not going to continue in my regular work. Uh, the other week, we wanted to start our equipment on a Saturday night, and we couldn't get it started because they had all filters that all froze up. Somehow moisture got into the fuel and it froze up and it wouldn't start. Well, what do we do now? We wanted to get to work on Monday morning early and we called around. People were already closed or didn't have them. We called one, two places. And one place I did call and they did have some filters. And I said, are you guys open Tomorrow, Sunday? Yeah, we're open from 9 to 3. Now, am I going to go on the Lord's Day and pick up those filters for Monday morning? What do you think I did? Yeah, I picked them up. You can call me uh, whatever you want. But I, I, I did. I didn't. On my way to the jail uh, service, I stopped in at Nap and picked up my filters and ready for Monday morning. And I don't, I did, that's not my norm. I, I think we ought to have conviction to observe the Lord's Day, but there may be occasions when you need something that you may go to the grocery store and get it. And I have no problem with that. But that shouldn't be our norm, that we do business and so on on the Lord's Day. So we ought to be observing the Lord's Day. But Christmas time, I, we don't have services on Christmas. I may have a Christmas message the, the Sunday before Christmas. I think you follow, see what I'm getting at is Christianity isn't observing certain Lord's days or, or not Lord, uh, certain days and it isn't what you eat or what you drink that makes you righteous. But what, what Romans does teach us is that... Uh, so I wanted to bring this out last night, and I didn't. What Romans does teach us is that uh, for the kingdom of God is not meat, drink, but, I like when there's a but, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to talk about righteousness tonight. I'm going to teach you righteousness. I'm going to talk, teach you peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Listening to the Spirit of God to lead you, because... When you're yoked up with Jesus, you're not, you're not your own. Sorry, you're tied up. And, and when your will has been broken and you're committed to yielding your will to his, you'll do just fine alongside of him. It may take some time, but I understand that's how they would break young oxen so that one day they could be the leader and the other and died and got old or whatever. So uh, I don't... James says we shouldn't be like the horse who has a bit in his mouth that you have to be bridled. No, we ought to be so in tune with Jesus. That's our goal. We're not all there. We ought to be so in tune that he, he just, the slick, slip of his finger, he gets our attention and we get, our back, get back on track and stay with him. Or a certain look or a certain whatever. A little prompting of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're moving along here and you see a magazine rack and it's like the Holy Spirit says, come on, keep moving. Jesus tugs your hands and says, come on, let's keep going. Don't, 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 no loitering. Don't hang around there. And, uh, and you might get your eyes on something or you might start thinking about, you might start wondering. 
And the Holy Spirit says, come on, get back on track. When, when I have a week of meetings like this, I have to really discipline myself to keep myself in preparation. I can't let my mind wander too much of what's out there or what, what somebody else is doing or what, you know. I may stay in touch with my wife just if she has anything, she, any needs or needs some, ask me a question or you know, I wonder what she's doing or whatever. I got to keep my focus. And discipline is a big thing in our Christian life. You can't get away from it. That's what disciple is, one who is disciplined, who disciples and teaches his spirit and teaches his soul to stay on tune, in tune, stay on track. All right. So I wanted to bring that in on, on Romans 14. The only, the only other thing in Romans 14 that 1 Corinthians 8 doesn't have is about meat and drinks and, and observing certain days. It's okay to observe certain days, but that's not, the, that's not the meat. That's not the righteousness that Jesus is looking for. It's okay to do that, but where the real crux is, is, is daily just taking our cross and saying, Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm dead to this. And, and I'm going to stay alive to you. Okay, let's look at Romans uh, chapter 6. And, and let's walk through it. He starts out with saying, when he concludes chapter 5, he says that, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So now we're talking about sin and grace. That... As sin hath reigned unto death, even so grace reigns through righteousness under eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we sin? And grace just says, yeah, I know you can't, you can't keep the law, so you just have to sin occasionally and keep stumbling and sin Grace says, God's going to overlook it. That's what some people believe. Paul comes back and he says in verse 2, absolutely not, God forbid. That's a strong statement. Grace doesn't overlook. But that's what some people believe. So these conservative Mennonites, they're all concerned about law, 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 and, and yeah, and yeah. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We're dead? Oh, we're dead to it? Are you? You have any problem with the law? You're dead to it? Or you're dead to sin? You don't have any problem? And know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? And by the way, there's no water in, in Romans 6. You say, what for heretic is this? I don't see any water. John the Baptist said that Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost and with fire. That's just how I take this. Baptism is, is somewhere else. It's not, uh, water is not, not here. It's being baptized. It's... it's it's, it's, it's him totally enveloping you with his Holy Ghost. All right? And sanctified in the Holy Ghost. And he says, uh, we were baptized into his death. Wherefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead. And they say, well, you were raised up out of the water. No, you were raised from the dead. And he says, by the glory of the Father, even so walk in newness of life. Are you dead? Or aren't you? Calvin, you dead? <laughs> I said yes and no. Are you dead or are you not? We're going to answer that question before we're through tonight. Romans 6 answers that question. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing, oh, did you know? Knowing this, he's, he's telling the Romans, you know this, that our old man is crucified 
that the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin. I like that. We are, when you come to Christ, you are no longer servant or a slave to sin. Period. You believe the Bible? Do you know that King James Version was written at a fifth and sixth grade level? It doesn't, you don't take a lot of intelligence to read and to know, understand what these words are saying. And by the way, when a 45 minute message, you speak about 58,000 words. Five, or not 58,000, 5,800, okay? All right, so he says, uh, if, now if the, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing, that's why I have no up here. Knowing that we cannot practice that Christ be raised from the dead, dieth no more, and hath, death has no more dominion over you. Death does not. We need to know this spiritual truth. If we don't know this, we're going to doubt our salvation. Am I saved or am I not saved? When, you're in, when you come to Christ and, to, and, and sin, uh, knowing that Christ had been raised from the dead and, hath, and, and, and death from the dead hath and dieth no more, death has no more dominion. It doesn't have, what does dominion mean? It means it doesn't have control over you. It doesn't have power over you. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So you come along and you say, well, I'm tempted to lie. The Holy Spirit says, you're, you're dead to that. Don't, don't do it. And before you know it, the first thing you know, you lied. Well, you convicted and said, you know, I didn't, I, I lied. I, I need to correct that. And so you go back, confess it, and say, hey, I lied. I, I, I didn't do what I said I did. And, and you correct it. But the Holy Spirit uh, gives you grace and shows you and enables you to humble. If you're not humble and you don't let the grace of God work in your life, you're not going to go back and make it right. And clear it up. And it will be on your conscience. But if you go back and clear it up, the grace of God says, humble yourself, go back and admit it. Yes, I did lie. I need to correct that. We should not be bearing false witnesses. We should not be saying things that are not true. Okay? I'm just using that as an example. And so the next time this thing comes around, you're beginning to learn by being yoked up with Jesus by listening to the Holy Spirit, he says, don't do it again. No, tell him to tell the truth. Even if it makes you look bad, makes you look terrible, tell the truth. And so you tell him the truth. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Verse 11. Now here's, here's, the, here's the crux. Uh... We don't need to serve sin because we, that, he, it doesn't have dominion. That power has been broken because of what Jesus did on the cross. Sin's power is broken. The victory is won. You, you, understand what, you understand that? We understand it by faith. Then the second thing is, is the word reckon. Just about that time the devil took your intention away and you're thinking about something else, you got distracted. No, stay with me. Reckon. Likewise, or the same as knowing that truth that sin doesn't have dominion over you, knowing that, likewise, the same way, reckon ye also yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon, another word, is consider yourself dead. Hey, I'm dead to that. So let's move along. Let's don't loiter around here. Let's don't allow that thought to hang around. Move along. I'm dead to that. Reckon it. Consider it dead. If you don't learn that, yeah, you, you begin what I said. In, in your soul, you're going to start the cycle of sin. 
and you're going to deep, wear some deep grooves, and next time it comes around, you're going to fall again. Whether it's lust or you're looking at something you shouldn't look at, you have a deep groove, and you just keeps going and going around and around. Because that's the way you always, you didn't learn to say no. I'm dead to, you didn't say, no, i got to move along. I'm dead to that. Likewise, knowing that the sin does not have dominion over you, then the sa- likewise, the same way you say, I'm dead to that, I'm going to consider myself dead to it, and I'm going to move along. Let me tell you what's in operation here. We're saved by grace through faith. Faith says, I just believe that Jesus is here, and I believe the grace of God is right here, and the grace of God is going to tell me to keep moving along. Don't loiter around. Don't tell that lie. Don't stop and look at that whatever. Get your phone shut off. Put it away. Don't. It'll take you into something you don't want to go. And stuff pops up, and it, next thing you know, your, your attention is when you should be reading your Bible, or you should be praying, or whatever. you got time to no, you, or you should be getting ready to, whatever. Move along. Don't hang around these thoughts of and entertaining things that are to no profit. Move along. It's the grace of God takes your hand and says, come on, let's move along. You're yoked up with Jesus. Let's keep moving. You're dead to that. Don't hang around there. Move. I don't know how much plainer I can tell you. Johnny, did you take a cookie out of the cookie jar? Nope. Mom says, hey, there's two missing. It's evidence. And he's not hungry at the supper table. Yeah, you, you, you took one. I know you did. You're not hungry. Well, yeah, Mom, I did. We adults do the same thing over and over and over and over. We get used to it. And it doesn't bother us. Daryl and I were going to uh, World Press, Missionary Press. I didn't have my seatbelt on, so the, his vehicle would remind me. He said, it'll, it'll keep dinging occasionally. Did it ding? It dinged, right. And I said, you know, I got a bad habit. He said, that dinger is your conscience telling you, get your seatbelt on. Now, should I wear a seatbelt? Yeah. I know I should, but you know what? I just haven't gotten the habit of using a seatbelt, and I have gotten some tickets for not having a seatbelt on. I'm going to be honest with you. I have lots of room to grow, and I should be wearing my seatbelt. I grew up in the era when you didn't have to wear them, and so (laughs) I try to make an excuse. It doesn't work. Uh, He said, that's your conscience, because I've worn groove in mine, and that area of my conscience has kind of got used to not wearing them. You see how it works? I, I'm, just, I'm using myself as an illustration. You get used to it, and it doesn't bother you not having my seatbelts on, what I, which should bother me. I should put them on. I know I should. So put them on, and after a while, in my, in my van that I have drove, came down here with, that dings and dings and dings and dings till you put them on, so I don't have any problem. It'll, I, well, i got to get rid of this dinger. i got to put them on, so I put them on. The Holy Spirit does that too. Jesus says, hey, you're yoked up with me. Come on, get your seatbelt on. All right, I'll put them on. I just don't like the way they feel on my chest. They're too tight, and I just would rather not have them on. Irritating, but I put them on. There's a lot more serious things than that. But that's how we're going to deal with sin in our lives. Sin says, Jesus, the Bible says that that the law is holy. There's nothing wrong with the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Did you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And did you love your neighbor as yourself today? On these two hang all the laws and the prophets. The Ten Commandments have been narrowed down to two commandments. The first five have to do with our relationship with God, not to use his name in vain and so on. And the, and the next one has don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet. If you love God, you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to be tempted to take your neighbor's wife. No. 
You're not going to be tempted to take your neighbor's whatever. You covet it. You covet what he has, and I'd like to have it, and I'm going to go steal it. No, if you love him, you love God, you love your neighbor, you're not going to do it. You're going to, you're going to be a person who gives rather than takes. And so the, the, all the law can do is, is, is tell you you're a sinner. So likewise, we're to give our, ye also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye shall would obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye yourselves, your members, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You're either doing one or the other. You're either yielding to the highway of holiness or you're heeding to the highway of the devil and giving yourself to him. There's no neutral. I was talking about this at the supper table tonight with my brother. There is no neutral ground. Sorry. You say, well, I'll just put it in neutral. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just going to be neutral. Well, you are making a decision by not yielding your life to Jesus Christ in the highway of holiness. You are yielding yourself to Satan and his power and his control. Yes, you are. Not maybe, not might, you are. And so you're, doing, you're yielding to one or the other day after day after day after day. And the more that you can you be used to yielding to the highway of holiness... It becomes a way of life. Are you with me? The scripture says, yield yourselves unto righteousness. Yield yourselves unto God, verse 13. Like I said, doesn't take a theologian to help me understand what that means. Because we're used to what, what, what yield signs are. Is you're to give the right of way to. You're to give right away of holiness in your life. For sin shall not have dominion. There it is again, verse 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but you are under grace. I wish that every evangelical Christian could get a hold of what it means to be under grace. Grace says put your seatbelt on. It's not that hard to put it on. And put it on because that's what the law requires. And you're going to show respect and you're going to show allegiance to those authorities that you're responsible to. And your grace says, come on, don't look at that. Grace says, don't lie. Don't tell the truth. And if you did, did say the untruth, then grace says, go back and clear it up. Humble yourself. That's grace. It enables me to do what Jesus wants me to do, and I'll stay yoked up with him. I don't know how more emphatic I can be, but get a hold of it. I am dead to that stupid stuff that takes me down to the gutter, that took that prodigal son out to the pig pen. That's the option. It's the only alternative. Either you're going to yield the highway of holiness or you're going to end up in the pig pen. He didn't think he was. I'm just going to go and enjoy it the rest of my life. Oh, yeah? Who says? Devil will tell you, but he's lying. There are many people who say they love Jesus and they're listening to a lie that grace covers my sinful living. God forbid. I don't care who's listening. They let's see it on YouTube. Maybe they'll get straightened out. Lord, have mercy on our souls. If we can't get a hold of this, God is very patient, and I'm very patient with you. You don't get a hold of it. Grace does not overlook your sinful living. Grace just simply says, "Yield to what's right." <laughs> if it isn't grace working, then it's. <laughs> The law just pounds you over the head, you sinner. Pounds you again, you sinner. You sinner. 
doesn't do anything for you. Just shows you you're a sinner. A sinner? And thou shalt not covet. I don't have the strength to change my way. But the grace of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, a brother prayed tonight, the power of God would flow in our through us. And, he, and if it doesn't speak to you tonight, I don't know what will. Because it's, it's very plain. Grace says, don't live there. Don't go there. Stop that habit of what the way you've always done it. Put your seatbelt on, Walter. He's so kind. He's so gentle. He, he, Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. I put my seatbelt on, and I feel good. Yeah. And I'm driving the speed limit. You know, there was times on the way down here that when, if you don't go with the flow, you're going to end up being a, somewhat of a hazard. But I couldn't believe it. There's times that traffic was all the way up to 75 and 80 mile an hour. Walter, you shouldn't be going that fast. So I go in a lane that is, and I just go in a lane and I stay with the traffic. And there's people going fast, past me this side and they're going to be past me this side. As soon as I move out, somebody's going to be on my bumper and I need to speed up some more and get, up, get back in again. So I just stand in the main traffic and go with the flow. And I don't, that, I mean, officers have grace too. Five mile an hour, eight mile an hour, you know, but they must have because nobody gets stopped going 75, once in a while 80. But God knows my heart. My intention is to, I have respect in my heart. I want to run the speed limit. He sees my bend. I'm not out in this lane seeing how fast I can go and stay with the fast traffic that's going 85 or 80. What? You follow what I'm saying? Grace says, just by the, the best that you can, just stay with. You don't want to become a hazard and everybody's on your bumper and getting buzzing around you and in going in and out and around Stay, I don't want to be a hazard. You may have your own perspective on that, but my conscience says, you know, I, I stay with the traffic and, and keep things moving along. I don't want to cause an accident. I'm, I, want to, I like to bring these things in be, and because they are practical. I don't know what it is you struggle with, Maybe ladies have problems with sharing too much information with each other sometimes, and gossip starts moving. The Holy Spirit says, uh, should you be talking about that? Is that how you're showing love to your sister or brother in the church? Maybe, maybe you shouldn't be passing some bad rumor around. The Holy Spirit says, no, don't do it. Okay. And you stop. Or maybe you shared some information to somebody that was not very kind. And the Holy Spirit says, go back and correct it. It's the grace of God that give, asks you to go back and, and correct it. And it's the grace of God that keeps you from doing it. And that's the only way you can keep the Ten Commandments or whatever law we're talking about. And whatever commandment there is. It's the grace of God that enables you to do it. The grace of God doesn't overlook it. How would we ever change how would we ever grow up spiritually? Keep yielding, and after a while, it just yielding to the, to the highway of holiness, yielding your life, your body, your spirit, your attitudes, you're yielding to the right way of living because you're yoked up with Jesus. He just tugs, tugs at you. Come on, come on, let's, come on, let's keep going. No lording, don't hang around. Move on. So we're to reckon or to consider, we, we know this, that we're dead. That's why I ask you, are you dead? Yes and no. You're going to deal with this old man that wants to sin. You're going to deal with him until you take your last breath. But he's not going to give you that much problem. If you're yoked up with Jesus and you have come in to discipline your life, I know there's always a curve that's going to come our way and we're not quite ready and catches us off guard sometimes. The Lord sometimes lets us fall on our face to show us that we still need him. I don't have it conquered. 
Coming up here and preaching doesn't always become easy, and it's just, I can handle it myself, Jesus. Meet me after I'm done. No, stay here with me, please. Help me through this. I need your grace to help me to, to break the word, to, to break this truth to us. And, and I, I want to show you how it works in my life, and, I, and, and you have maturity. You can show other people how it can work in their lives as you counsel and you minister to other people. And it's beautiful, but we got to get a hold of it. We need to practice it. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? The same thing comes back. No, God forbid. Absolutely no. Twice in this chapter, God forbid, don't think that grace... You know what? The Galatians, they frustrated the grace of God. They went about establishing their own, own righteousness by being circumcised, pushing circumcis- circumcises, and so on. Paul says, you got it all messed up. You're frustrating the grace of God. They thought righteousness came by circumcision, came by cer- keeping, ser- observing certain days, observing this law and sacrificing... Grace couldn't even work. Don't frustrate the grace of God by trying to do it yourself. Come to Jesus and say, I can't do this. A little boy, if I'd seen him up here, and, and he'd be two years old, and his shoestrings would be open, I'd say, tie your shoe. He'd look at me, why? I don't know how to tie my shoe. Or the little boy would say, daddy wants to help me. He'd say, no, I can do it myself. And he has no idea how to do it. We think we know how to tie our shoe, and we don't know how to do it. The daddy comes to this two-year-old. I don't know. Maybe some learn. I don't think I could tie my shoe at two, year, two years old. And, and daddy says, now, here, I want to show you. He takes, and, he, and slowly ties his shoe. And guess what? By the time he's five, he probably can tie his shoe himself. Right? That's kind of a poor, poor illustration. But the daddy... The Holy Ghost comes along and says, let me show you how to do it. Just say no. I'm dead to that. There's other things that are right and and yield to the highway of holiness. Don't let let this thing of, of, of lying and stealing, becoming envious, and the sins of the Spirit, and even sins of commission, where we commit certain acts of sin, like, like David, he should have been out in war fighting instead of at home uh, on his housetop and watching Bathsheba take her bath. Shame on him. Uh, and, then, and then he had, and that wasn't good enough, he had someone, his servants come and have her bring, bring her and then had her husband put in front of the battle and have him killed and then he could take him as his wife. Oh, I don't even like to think about that. That's so ugly. But that's just how sin works. I don't know, David had the Spirit of God. Wasn't the Spirit of God working? What? David, get yourself off. Get on. There's... Stop it. Get out of there. Adam should have said, Eve, let's get out of here. Don't be looking at that tree. Let's, get, let's move along. Get out of here. But he was quiet. Husbands, stay with your wife. Wives, stay with your husband. We'll talk about that Sunday morning. But... Uh, we need to help each other. Don't hang around. Don't be looking. Don't be. Don't let. Tomorrow night I might may talk about our mind, and and how our mind, our way of thinking, it needs to be transformed. I don't know. Pray for me. But I'm thinking. I'll talk about Romans 12, about the transformed mind. All right. But God be thanked that you were, past tense. You were the servants of sin, but. Ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. What's that form of doctrine? The doctrine was that your heart has been renewed. Sin does not have dominion. The spirit of new life in Christ Jesus said, yes, you are delivered. Let me tell you something. I just looked up tonight that the first time that a... Does anybody know the first time that a 747 flew... A 747 first flew in 1970. You know what its gross weight was? 
Its gross weight was 735,000 pounds. Now, how many tons is that? About half, a 40 ton? 40 ton would be 80,000 pounds. Forty eight thousand four hundred and forty five pounds of fuel. I don't know how much fuel is forty eight thousand four hundred and uh, four hundred and forty five, but seven hundred and thirty five thousand. So forty thousand. Half of seven thirty five is about forty thousand ton, right? So who's good at math here? Doesn't matter. 735,000 pounds is heavy. You know what? The law of gravity says, ha, ha, 747, you'll never fly. When they built that thing, they did their science, their whatever, whoever built them things, the engineers had everything engineered, and the law of gravity says it will never fly. Now, when they put that thing the first time on its runway, it was full of fuel. It could hold up to 525 people. And I don't know what weight was there, but if you had 45,000 pounds of fuel, so you're almost up to 800,000. So probably 40, 400,000 pounds. 400,000 tons. Look it up if you don't believe it's that heavy. A, a law of gravity says it'll never fly. You know what the law of gravity is? Everything stays on the floor. Everything stays on the ground. But there's another law in, in effect here. Who knows what other law is in effect? That we're going to see if this law works. Got any pilots here? Excuse me. Any pilot? There's another law that says, yes, that 747 is going to fly. The law of sin and death says you can't live victoriously. Nope. But the law of new life in Christ Jesus says, yes, you can. Watch it. And guess what? We're victorious over sin because of new life in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. And we can live victoriously. We don't have to sin. Because of the grace of God that is in operation in your life that takes your hand and says, come on, stay with me. We're going to walk right past that temptation. We're not going to yield to it. We're not going to give in to that whatever, and we're going to keep right on moving, and you can live victoriously. You're dead to that. That's the grace of God. There's another law, in fact, says that, yes, that 747 is going to fly, and when that thing went down that runway, what makes up what's called aerodynamics? says, this thing is going to fly. Watch it. He started humming, then Bill started humming, and anyway, them, them, them propellers in those engines, four engines, was just ah, humming in it. I can you imagine the roar? Ooh, man. All of a sudden, it was airborne. They knew it would. It wasn't the guess. We're not going to, this is not going to be a, 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 a crash. It's going to fly. They knew it. They believed it. And, the, and aerodynamics says, yes, it can. If you get an aerodynamics says, if you get enough of thrust, I, it has, it's called thrust. And if you get enough of air moving over those wings, it has, a, it has an expansion of, of wings of 231 feet. You get enough of air moving over top of those wings, it creates a vacuum. So you have thrust and you have vacuum. Guess what? That 747 took off. And it defied the law of gravity. Grace of God takes your hand and leads you through and away from it and doesn't allow you to yield. Says, ha, ha, law of sin. You don't have to sin. Law of grace, new life of, in Christ. The law of new life in Christ Jesus says, yes, you don't have to sin. I don't want you to forget that as long as you live. There's a truth here in Romans 6 that you better never forget. Now, did, did Paul lie to us? Absolutely not. I experienced exactly what it's saying. That's how I've gotten victory. 
victory over alcohol, victory over cigarettes, victory over whatever in my teen years, in my rebellious years. You don't have to go there. You don't have to live there. Over swearing? I mean, my language was terrible. I had terrible habits of certain words and things that I said. And I tell you, you just can't, it's so hard to break because you have gotten such grooves and you wore such grooves. You've got developed such habits and you. And there's a lot of euphemisms sometimes that you ought to put aside too that are just, they're euphemisms. They're just another form of saying God or Jesus. Don't use them. G or gosh or whatever. Don't use them. They're euphemisms. They're forms of evil. We need to ask the Lord to just cleanse us up, clean up the inside so the outside can be clean too. And the grace of God is going to take, take you right and you don't have to yield to it. It's not going to have dominion over you and you can move right, right along. You don't have to keep yielding and stumbling over there. No. I don't care how many years you've gotten into such habits. And Calvin was talking to me. He says, so Paul, Paul, what tell, Paul was telling us was that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. And he wouldn't be, allow himself to be uh, brought under control of any. And he talked about going a 30-day fast from coffee. Ooh. Would I take a 30-day fast from coffee? Oh, I don't know, Calvin. You stepped on my toe. Maybe, maybe I should. At least maybe one day, maybe two days. Just, just say no to coffee. Just, to, just for discipline. Discipline is always good for us. All right, let's keep going. It's soon time to close. I don't want to keep you too long, but I tell you, I want you to never forget Romans 6. Not that this is above, but there's a principle here. We're to act upon a fact. The fact is we're dead to sin. That's a fact. Or else the Bible's lying. Let not... You are dead to sin. Let not sin have dominion over you. He says, Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Cooperate with God and start having a, a hate, for, hate for sin. Eschew evil. What is required of, of the old man of God to do justly? The love, mercy, and what else? To walk humbly with thy God. Thank you. Hate evil. The old nature, we are to reckon it dead. It's still there. It's dormant. As long as the Holy Ghost, the grace of God is working in your life, it's dormant. Don't feed it. Let it die. As sure as you start feeding it, I'll tell you what, the next thing you know, you premeditate on sin and you're going to fall. Sometimes we sin because, well, we just weren't aware. There's, there's iniquity is premeditated sin. I heard this way, I heard it explained. Transgression is when you do something wrong and you didn't even think about it and you did it. You know why you just did it without thinking about it? Because you've already got grooves worn in and you, it's become a habit. Yeah, come on. That's why. And we just do it. We didn't even, oh, I didn't even think about it. Premeditated sin is when you think about it and say, yes, I'm going to go ahead with this. And you know the Holy Ghost is saying, don't do it. You know why I don't, but conscience don't bother me when I don't put my seat belts on? I've got a habit. I've been used to it. I've got grooves worn in. As sure as I start obeying and put it on, I get in, I feel, ah, yeah, I need my seatbelt on. And every time you get in, you, you start getting into the habit, doing, putting your seatbelt on, doing what's right. Yeah, that's how it works. And next thing you know, you have to premeditate. Well, I'm not going to put my seatbelt on. That's premeditated. But if you don't do it, and you, oh, I never even thought about it. I did is you already have some grooves. You've, been, you've gotten used to it. That's just how it works. And, and 
The more you obey, you yield to the will of God, and you obey right living, the more you obey, the more it bothers you when you don't do it. See? Your conscience is being tuned in with holiness and what's right. And you have a good conscience before God and before man. And you get used to saying nice things about your brothers and sisters in the church. It comes a way of life. Isn't it nice? You feel ugly as soon as you have a thought of, why did he preach so long? Why didn't he stop 10 minutes ago? Wish he'd let us go home. I want to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. I don't want to keep you long. It's Friday night. Sleep in tomorrow morning. But I want you to get this truth. God, be thanked that you were the servant's sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, that, that new life in Christ Jesus. That's the doctrine. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of sin. Now we become servants and slaves to doing what's right. It comes, it comes natural. It, you get used to doing what's right. The grace and power of God is flowing, and we're going down that runway. The, the propellers are putting that thrust on in behind and going out the back and pushing this, this plane down the runway, and, and, and the, vacuum, the air is going over the, 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 the wings, and it's creating a vacuum, and you're going to fly. Aerodynamics says, yes, it'll fly. And you're going to fly too. And the grace, the new life of Christ Jesus is operating in your life. And I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of the flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, you got used to living in uncleanness and in iniquity, even so. You kept yielding, you kept yielding, you kept yielding, and it became a way of life. Now he says, keep yielding to righteousness and start obeying in your members of servants and righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were freed from righteousness. What fruit did you have in those things? Dead in the street, pig pen, eating the husks in the, in the, that the pigs were eating. That was your fruit. That boy never thought he'd get, end up in the pig pen eating the husk uh, on the corn from the husk off the ears of corn which you are now ashamed of, for the end of those things is death. Whew. Who wants to run into a dead-end street? He did. But now, being made free from sin, you became servants of God, for you, for you have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. God says, I'm going to give you a gift. He, you can't work for it, because if you could work for it, then God would be indebted to you, and God's never going to be indebted to anybody. You follow through, he gives you grace, he gives you strength, and you consider you reckon yourself dead to sin, and the grace of God is causing you to fly in holiness. God says, wait till we get to the other side, I'll reward you with a gift. Yes, I will. And you're going to be excited and happy. The, it, the, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because you've learned to fly in holiness. You learn to fly by the grace of God. That's what the grace of God does. God, the grace of God never overlooks sin. A sin is always going to be sin. It's ugly. It's, it's, it's wicked. It's, it doesn't please God. The way for grace are, you, grace are you saved through faith, and that of not even yourselves is the gift of God, not of works that any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. The grace of God is working in me and putting you and I on display for a testimony of the grace of God. Here's people at, 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 at Bethel, Conservative Mennonite Church that are walking in holiness, God says, I love putting my grace on display. Just like this pulpit. Somebody built this. I don't know who. Somebody built it. But their, their, their good workmanship is on display. And God wants to put you on display. And, and people say, boy, I just like what, what you're becoming. You say, it's because of Jesus. And he gets glory. It's Jesus that's making me shine. I had someone meet me a long time after Bible school at, at Maranatha, and he said, you know, I just like this way I see your life is blossoming like a flower. That's because of Jesus. Glory to Jesus. He, he's the one that's helping me. Otherwise, I'd be in the pig pen. I don't have anything more to say. The Holy Spirit says, you've said it. But if you didn't get it tonight, you were sleeping. 
or you, or you had some, your mind wandering, allowed your mind to wander off somewhere. I think you probably knew this before, but I simply wanted to remind you again and rivet it in your heart and mind. My prayer is when I go home tonight is that you will continue to meditate and think about this because you know what? You got some homework. Right here, we have uh, chapter 6 is the principle of life, uh, uh, holy life. And in chapter 7, we have the pursuit. There's a struggle. Chapter 7 is wrapped up in one verse in in Galatians 5.16. The flesh and the spirit are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. And there's a struggle goes on in seven. But there's a pursuit. You are pursuing holiness and a holy life. And then in chapter, that's chapter seven, then in the power of the holy life is in chapter eight. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Why, can, why is chapter eight Show us the victory and and walking in in the spirit because of what we learned in chapter 6. Chapter 6, 7, and 8. Beautiful, beautiful steps on how some people call it the Roman road. You learn to walk in, you you get the principle of holiness in chapter 6. Chapter 7 talks about the struggle. In chapter 8, you're walking in the spirit. And just what I tried to demonstrate tonight, it's the grace of God that takes your hand, it's the Spirit of God that says, stay yoked up with Jesus and learn from him, and you'll walk in holiness. Tonight, if you're here, and, and you're not sure where you're at, but you want to commit yourself to yield, obey, or reckon yourself dead, you're making a commitment to yield to the will of God and you're making a commitment to to obey what's right. Those three. Reckon yourself dead, yielding yourself, and obeying. And as we sing, I just want you to stand and make that commitment. And and I encourage you to just keep meditating and think about chapter 6. Because the new life in Christ Jesus wants you to live in victory. Now, I don't know what it is you're struggling with tonight or, what, or, or whatever it is that's dominating your life, but you can be free. And don't listen to the devil that says, no, you know, this is just the way I am. It's, you know, I, I don't, I, yeah. Hey, the grace of God, can, if he can change the Apostle Paul, he can change anybody. So if you're here tonight, let's pray. Father, I thank you for each one that's here. And I thank you that you are here, and I pray that as we sing and as we uh, give an invitation you would give people the courage to make a commitment to to walk in the highway of holiness to yield themselves to that and experience the grace of god in yielding their lives to you allowing the holy spirit to live victoriously helping them helping them to live victoriously sin not letting sin reign in their bodies we ask it in jesus name amen if you're here